We're going to talk on diabetes in the elderly. And this is a relatively large topic and one that applies to everybody who practices medicine in virtually any area because we have a lot of people who have diabetes in the older person. Conflicts of interest. In the last three years, I haven't worked for any company that uh, has anything to do with diabetes directly, though uh, over my lifetime I've worked with, I think, every company at some stage, but the three-year rule is okay. And I've done that deliberately because I'm tired of filling out the stupid forms that the university expects me to fill out every time I work with anybody. Uh, but I do want to point out that out of all of working with companies, I've learned that you should only use drugs that cost $2 a month whenever possible. That's basically metformin. Could be sulfonylureas, but I'll point out to you, sulfonylureas aren't ideal in older people. So you're down to one $2 a month drug. I'll talk about some of the more expensive ones towards the end. So for those of you who can't remember from years ago, basically diabetes started out uh, with Sutra in 600 BC, uh, the Ayurvedic uh, tradition, and he talked about Medhumia, which is honey urine, which they found that people would walk down the street, they pee in the streets, and by the way, if you go to India today, they do exactly the same thing. So you can walk down India, see somebody pee in the street, and if you see all the ants rushing to the urine, that means the person's got diabetes. And so that's how the first diagnosis of diabetes was made. And he, Sasutra said there were two types. One were thin people, type 1 diabetes, and the older were uh, and the second were older, fatter people, type 2 diabetes. The natural history of diabetes is fairly straightforward, and I think we all recognize that, that we have basically type 1 diabetes that occurs predominantly in people under the age of 20, but there's a small amount that occurs throughout the lifetime. Uh, then we have maturity onset diabetes of youth. This can occur in any age. The youngest person we have at SLU who has maturity onset diabetes of youth, had, onset was at three months of age. She always comes into hospital with sugars between 1,000 and 2,000, and everybody calls her a type 1 diabetic, but she's never ketoacidotic or anything else. So you can get those groups, and you need to be aware of that. Obviously, people are getting fatter, so type 2 diabetes is moving to younger and younger people as we get fatter. And then right at the end, you've got the type 1 and a half, which is as we get older, we tend to get some pancreatic insufficiency, so it tends to be a mixture of the disease between old and young people, uh, between uh, uh, having not enough insulin and insulin resistance. So. The prevalence of diabetes has gone up in the United States, um, and there's a little catch here. Basically, back in about 96, we changed the diagnostic category. So the Diabetes Association decreased the fasting blood sugar from 140 to 126, and immediately said, look how many more diabetics we have sort of always worries me when societies do that. It's like, let's make everybody in the world have Alzheimer's disease, and that's very exciting. So everybody in the world should have diabetes. So we've got to recognize that this was most probably inappropriate, particularly for older people. But there has been a real increase as well that we need to be aware of. So there are a number of similarities between uh, older people and diabetes. These include things, uh, Ashok Meradian and I, when Ashok was a fellow many years ago, showed that a young, uh, that diabetics have a decrease in unwinding of the DNA, and the same thing is true when you get older. There's an increase in cross collagen cross-linking, uh, capillary basement thick thickening. We showed that the energy pump, the sodium potassium ATPase, goes down both in aging and in diabetics. And then there are a lot of clinical things. Cataracts are more common in diabetics up to the age of 70. After 70, everybody has a cataract, so it's not really any difference at that stage. Uh, diabetics have accelerated atherosclerosis, and we'll talk about them not being able to think so well, and changes in functional status. 
Well, when we think of type 2 diabetes, we tend to focus and think that it's really due to insulin resistance. And you can see that there are two genes that play a major role in insulin resistance that are the FATSO gene and the PPAR gamma gene. But what you have to recognize here is tons of genes in type 2 diabetes are actually decreasing insulin. So it's really not insulin resistance, but it's insulin resistance in the presence of a decreased ability of the pancreas to make enough insulin. And if you think about this, you can all see some young fat person age 30 who weighs 400 pounds and their glucose is perfectly okay. That means that they can push enough insulin out of their pancreas. It's really the dying off of insulin out of the pancreas that in the end creates the type 2 diabetes epidemics that we tend to see. When we think of the pathogenesis of diabetes in older people, obviously a part of it is due to uh, insulin-mediated glucose disposal. This is mainly in the muscle. Uh, but another part is actually a decrease in the non-insulin-mediated glucose uptake. This is in the brain and in other areas. This is important to recognize because if you try to lower the glucose to the same level in an old person as a young person, and you're doing it through an insulin-mediated mechanism, you will finish up making the person very hypoglycemic. You have to recognize one of the reasons we're changing what we think are the normal values that we should have for uh, older people. In addition to that, in young, middle-aged people with type 2 diabetes, the major problem is often the liver. The liver just doesn't work that well. In older people, Graydon Manili showed many years ago that in fact the liver tends to continue to work fairly well uh, in the type 2 diabetic who's older, and it's really all the peripheral stuff that is changing. And then in addition to that, the decrease in insulin is much more marked in the older di diabetic. So, uh, some time ago, the New England Journal published an article looking at the incidence of diabetic uh, complications in uh, uh, older uh, or United States adults. And what I did is I went and pulled out the appendix. So this is looking at the older people instead of the whole population. But their message was, the world has got better. We are already getting many less complications. The reasons for this are not totally clear. One was, of course, the change in the definition of diabetes. If you make people with less diabetes or no diabetes diabetic, you're going to get less diabetic complications. That sort of makes sense. Uh, beyond that, we had JNC5 in 1993, which said that diabetes is similar to uh, atherosclerosis, and we really need to get the blood pressure down to a reasonable level. Uh, we got metformin in 1995, it was approved in 94, was available in 1995. That was 10 to 20 years after the rest of the world got it, but you know, America, when you got a good safe drug, we basically never put it on the market. Lousy, dangerous drugs that hardly work, Every day we seem to have a new one of those, so this seems to make no sense, but that's how it is. And then we had the cholesterol guidelines as well. So all of these have played a role in bringing down the complications of diabetes. But it, most probably the biggest piece was the introduction of metformin more than anything else. And you can see in that upper panel there that there was no uh, metformin at the beginning. And then as we added uh, metformin, there were less and less use of sulfonylurea and other drugs. This is the one thing that's important when you look at people over the age of 65. It turns out that it doesn't matter how fat you are, okay? And there's a lot of data in geriatrics, and we keep on pointing this out, that fat people do better when they're old. When you're young, you want to be skinny. When you're old, you don't want to be super fat, but a BMI of 28 to 30 is not too bad. And this just shows you that in diabetics over the age of 65, in fact, being fat makes very little difference to your mortality. So fatness is a problem of young and middle age, not so much of older people. And there's relatively good data to support that. I'll show you a slide towards the end. Now, when we think of diabetes in anybody, and by the way, everything I'm saying really applies to people 50 and above, because we've got a lot of data in 50 to 65 year olds. But talking about the older population. Uh, if you look at diabetics, they have 
a lot of things wrong with them along with their diabetes. Many of these are actually caused by the diabetes, so they have much higher disability, mobility impairment, they tend more likely to be depressed, they're more likely to fall, they're more likely to have incontinence, and they're more likely to have some degree of dementia. All of this has been put together and all the diabetic societies around the world, so that's the American Diabetes Association, the European Working Party, and the International Association uh, uh, of Geront uh, Geriatrics and Gerontology. I sat on the committee for the last one, but it doesn't matter. Everybody at the same time came up with the conclusion that really, if you're old, over 60 or 65, your hemoglobin A1C should not be below seven. There is a sort of movement at the moment uh, coming out of WashU in particular with uh, Dr. McGill that diabetics, we should get people when they're pre-diabetic and uh, hemoglobin A1C of 5.7 is bad for everyone. The data to support that is zilch that I can find. So when you go after people with very low at any age hemoglobin A1Cs, you increase hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia is not good for anyone. It's particularly not good for older people, and that's the movement to hemoglobin A1C of 7 or greater, and if you're frail, you go between 7.5 and 8, and if you're in long-term care or end of the li life, somewhere between 8 to 9. So this is a major change over the last five to six years in how we think about treating diabetes. And I still get a lot of people referred to me who fundamentally are very upset because their hemoglobin A1C is only 6.3 or 6.2 and they're age 80. So please get the message through to the internists who are doing that, that that's dangerous, okay? And there's no data to support it at this stage. Uh, so when we look at diabetes and functional status, we can look around the world. There are many studies that have shown in Wales, uh, in France, uh, our study here in uh, St. Louis African American shows the increase in injurious falls in diabetes, and I'll show you some other data from there just now, and in addition to that, studies that we did in Mexico City have all shown the same thing. Diabetics tend to have worse functional status than non-diabetics, and it's one of the diseases associated with the highest decline in functional status. So this is a study that was done some time ago, and what it really shows is that subclinical functional uh, limitations, uh, this is that you can't do five chair stands, uh, a balance test, or six-minute walk, is much more increased in diabetics. Here we're showing again a study where if you look here, you can see walking time, heavy housework, climbing 10 steps, preparing meals, shopping, any task, diabetics do worse than age-matched other people. In our inner city, St. Louis, African Americans, we show that middle-aged, so this is 50 to 65 now, African Americans are much more likely to die if they have diabetes, and also they're much more likely to have one of the basic activities of daily living miss missing. For the students who don't know what these basic activities of daily living, it's very easy. It's what you do when you get up in the morning. The first thing you do is you transfer. You don't have to be able to walk, but you do have to be able to transfer from a bed to a wheelchair. The second one, if you're like me, is you run like mad to the bathroom or you leave a puddle behind. Having gone to the bathroom, we hope you wash your hands, and now SSM is going to teach us all how to wash our hands, which I'm really grateful for after 45 years of medicine that I've got to do a class on how to wash my hands. I'm so excited, <laughs> you know, uh, and I'm sure the rest of you are enjoying that too. And then after you've washed your hands, when I lived in California, it was wonderful. You could walk outside without your clothes on, just like all the other idiots in California. When you come to Missouri and you do that, they call the police. I just don't understand that, so you should dress. After dressing, if you're really civilized, you sit down and eat, and then finally, just finally, you get in the car, you're halfway to work, your gastrocolic reflex kicks in and you've got to go, but because you're totally intact, you don't leave a little green, green turd behind in your car. Those are the basic activities of daily living, and those always predict poor outcomes. You can't live at home if you're missing one of those. You 
finish up in nursing homes and you die earlier. And diabetes accelerates that. So this is looking in our inner city study, and you can see here that diabetics have worse ADLs, IADLs, SPPB, one leg strand, and grip strength. And here's a meta-analysis showing you that when you look at physical disability in diabetics, they have much more physical disability, or ADL and IADL loss. What we tend not to do in endocrinology is look at the upper limbs in diabetics. We think about some of this other stuff, but in fact, we pay little attention, as do most of us, to upper limbs. You know, if somebody says they've got a sore shoulder, eh, send them off to somebody, physical therapy or somewhere. So McGill, Dr. McGill up at Wash U with a physical therapist actually looked at it, and it turns out that diabetics, as they get older, have accelerated inability to move their shoulders, which is important for dressing yourself and other things. And in addition to this, they have problems with their hands. This is the prayer sign, and a normal prayer sign is we push the palms together and you can't see anything between. If you basically have diabetes, you get a bigger and bigger hole in between. It's saying that you've got stiff muscles that don't work as well in your hands when you've got diabetes. So a friend of mine, Alan Sinclair, when he was working in Wales, basically decided, let's look at how important this is in real life to a diabetic. And what he showed is in Wales, diabetics read less, they garden less, they use the telephone less, they're less likely to write uh, letters, and they're more like, less likely to go out socially. So when we look at this, we can put this all together, and this is just pointing out that there are many things in diabetes that make a difference. There's how high your glucose is or how low. Both hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia lead you towards getting diabetes. Insulin resistance plays a major role and lack of physical activity all come together. The central piece is the loss of muscle mass and muscle strength leading to sarcopenia. Uh, but if you have hypoglycemia, you're more likely to get depression. High blood sugar, you're going to get cognitive dysfunction, again, with hypoglycemia. These will lead to frailty. Uh, if you're hypoglycemic or you have a cardiac uh, autonomic neuropathy, you're more likely to have syncope. You're more likely to fall if you're diabetic, finish up with hip fractures. And this all comes together going from frail to hospitalizations. Once you're hospitalized, you're more likely to be disabled, mainly because remember, if you come into hospital, you spend three days in any hospital anywhere in the world, you lose about a kilogram of muscle. That's terrible. Why do you lose it? Because we don't get people out of bed, we leave them in bed, we don't feed them. Nobody should be allowed to come into a hospital and not get dressed in the morning when you're in a hospital. Get out of bed and go sit in a lounge at least as a minimum. That's been shown multiple times in geriatrics. We've tried very hard to get this to happen at SLU, and if we sit on the ward, we can get people out. Some of the time, the nurses tell me they can't tell people to get up. It's their right not to get up in hospital. Of course, they have no problem giving them toxic medicines and telling them they've got to take them, but getting them out of bed, which actually has better outcomes than almost anything else we do in a hospital we can't do. But this is fun and that's why we do these crazy things in medicine. We're starting to understand in the ICUs now that you've got to get people out of bed because if you don't do it in the ICU, they do terribly as well. So if we can do it in the ICU, we should be getting it out, everybody out of bed, and nobody should be undressed, i.e. in pyjamas during the day. I fortunately never wear pyjamas, so if I come into hospital, they'll be forced to make me dress because it's the only way they're going to get clothes on me while I'm in hospital. So it's another way of looking at it, you know. <laughs> Recognize you can force people to do things in the end. Um, trying to make it funny so you'll remember it, okay, please, for the students. I've got no hope anybody else is going to remember this, but if the students remember it, you can change and improve outcomes down the line. So we go on, and a lot of you have heard about frailty and stuff, but it becomes very important to diabetes. So somebody who is frail, these are people who, when under a stressful condition, the person has diminished ability to carry out important practice, social activities of daily living. It needs to be distinguished from disability. So you would think that here Renoir is basically disabled and frail, but look at how he's painting. He's despite his arthritis, holding a paintbrush like this, and there is the painting that he produced holding his paintbrush in a clenched fist. So, 
frailty is different from having some degree of disability that you can overcome. So when we think about how you become frail and disabled, this is a sort of cascade. You start off with old-fashioned sarcopenia, loss of muscle mass that's not due to cachexial peripheral vascular disease. You then develop keratopenia. Kratos was the god of uh, strength in the Greek, and this is a loss of force, that's your strength. You then go on to dynopenia, which is a loss of power. That's the speed at which you can do a forceful activity. And what really matters is the speed at which you can do it. You know, Mr. Universe, beautiful muscles, it's mainly water. You go up to him, you take your finger and push him and he falls over. They're not functional muscles. So muscles have to be functional to make a difference. And that's that they can do something quickly with the muscle and get generate power with that muscle. And then you go to frailty, and we'll talk about that in a second, but this is fatigue, lack of uh, re resistance, lack of aerobic uh, activity, too many illnesses, loss of weight, and that goes to disability. So uh, Linda Freed, uh, basically at the beginning of uh, this century, uh, came up with a categorization of a physical phenotype for frailty. And she said if you lose weight 10 pounds in a year, if you report exhaustion, if you're weak, grip strength in the lowest 20%, walking speed, low, uh, slowest 20%, and low physical activity, lowest 20%, this is what we will define as frail. And if you have three of these, you're frail, two of these, you're pre-frail. And it turns out in people over the age of 70 in the cardiovascular health study, about 7% are frail. It turns out that females always have more frailty and disability than men. Just remind you that females outlive men but they always have more frailty disability. My wife tells me this makes sense. They frail, females are frail and disabled because they have to look after men and that takes a lot of effort and they outlive us because how the hell would we survive if they weren't around? Both of those make sense to me, <laughs> okay. Uh, moving along, what about diabetes and frailty? So in a study we did with uh, uh, Rodriguez Manis and uh, Alan Sinclair in Toledo in Spain, we showed in fact in a large population that if you're frail and you have diabetes, you are much, much more likely to die. And we use both a physical phenotype and a multimorbidity uh, 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 context. And you can see the differences are huge if you at the top end, five out of five for the frailty scale, you die very quickly if you're a diabetic. And I'll show you more that says this is important. So the frailty index that is quick and easy to use is the one that uh, belongs to the IANA and basically was written on a napkin in about 15 minutes at lunch when I was bored and I felt there was nothing else to do and I wrote down frail and I said ask people if they fatigued, ask if they can climb one flight of stairs, can they walk a block, how many illnesses over five means they've got polypharmacy and have they lost weight and quite honestly at the time it was sort of the guy doing the meeting, I said publish this, you'll be very famous. And he said, well, I don't know, you know, I, where's the evidence for this? I said, I'm right, I'm always right. And uh, some of you know I think that. Okay, so that's fine. And it turns out that I was right. And it was eventually uh, first uh, proven in Western Australia because Leon Flicker sent a paper to the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism showing that low testosterone is related to frailty. And they said, wonderful paper, except no one's ever proven that this frail scale has any validity at all. So he had to actually prove the frail scale was valid to publish his paper, which he then did. Uh, and at this stage, there were at least 14 validations in basically uh, five continents around the world. Only Africa has not validated, and it's used in many places. In Singapore, they showed the frail scale is the single best way of knowing who's going to come back to hospital within 30 days, which is becoming more and more important. In our African-American population, as you can see here, using the frail scale and also the freed scale, uh, people who have diabetes are much more likely to be frail. And here again, when we look at our function in our African-Americans, you can see worse function, uh, worse one leg stand, grip strength, uh, more likely to fall, more likely to die. Um, so. One of our medical students, Tony Lassini, then went ahead and did a study in the diabetic clinic at SLU. And the question was, 
whether or not people in the diabetic clinic were more likely to be frail, more likely to have sarcopenia, and more likely to be cognitively impaired. And he looked at people aged 50 uh, uh, and above, and basically at around about the age of 50, around 20% of people were frail. And then he looked at what this meant six months later and corrected for hemoglobin A1c, so they were all, quote, the same corrected level of diabetes control. And it turns out that if you're frail, you're much more likely to come back to hospital in six months, and you're also much more likely to develop a new disability over that period of time. And these were much better predictors than anything else we have for how your diabetic's going to do. So glucose is unimportant. The ability of an endocrinologist to function is unimportant if the endocrinologist in somebody 50 and older is not treating frailty, not treating, uh, we'll show you sarcopenia in a minute. Okay, same sort of thing. So does it make any difference if you actually treat these people when they're frail? And there's one study that comes out of uh, Louisville, I think, and basically not a great study, but they did show that putting people who are frail into an exercise program actually makes a difference to their outcome. So the treatment of diabetes when you're old and frail is exercise programs because people, as you know, don't always do things that they're supposed to do. So the next thing we go to is sarcopenia. And sarcopenia is easy, as you see from this picture that you've got up here. Very simple. You come along, you're old and you're frail. There's a swimming pool. You exercise, get across your swimming pool. And you've done your exercise, and now you're rejuvenated. That's all you really need to know about sarcopenia. It's going to be fixed by exercise. So sarcopenia is now defined is a lack of muscle in somebody who's got poor function, either walking slowly or grip strength are the two things that are used. Yes, I know that grip strength isn't a function. All the people who came up with the definitions, with the exception that the one I wrote, actually used grip strength as a function. Can't help it that the average academic doesn't understand what they're writing half the time. Therefore, the students never believe a consensus paper. It's made up by a group usually when I started out on these of old men, we now have added some old women to it, and I thought it would get better when we added the old women, and it's exactly the same. The problem is you get people who can't read who basically do consensus papers. Sorry, Adrian, if you've done some, but I've sat on too many committees anymore not to believe that what happens is you get opinions of people who've been in the field a long time and they don't go with the literature all the time. So it's nice to know their consensus papers, but realize they can be wrong. So when we look at a diabetic's muscle, diabetics have much more fat in their muscle and they also fundamentally have less muscle. And that starts somewhere around about the age of 40. They have a shift in the muscle type from type 1 to type 2, so they lose their ability to do endurance and a lot of this is due to the loss of satellite cells so you know muscle you have your muscle cells but the satellite cells whenever you injure the muscle they get activated to build more nuclei in the muscle and make the muscle stronger again and both type 1 and type 2 diabetes actually kill the ability of satellite cells to turn on. And this is most probably the major reason we run into trouble. How do you fix satellite cells in diabetics? Well, it's fairly easy. If you go and exercise, you increase the satellite cells. So exercise is the answer. And now I'm going to just show you a series of papers that all show the same thing. Diabetics have less quadriceps strength. Uh, diabetics have uh, uh, two times uh, uh, less uh, appendix lean mass uh, in men and women, there's extensive loss of skeletal muscle, uh, there's a greater decline in muscle mass, muscle strength, functional capacity with aging, and diabetics walk slower and they can't do as well in a six minute walk. So all of this suggests that sarcopenia may be important, and remember sarcopenia is a big piece of frailty, so 
We came up with a screen for sarcopenia because otherwise you've got to do a DEXA and then you've got to basically measure the walk uh, and all sorts of things. It's just beyond most people in their clinic to get this stuff done. So we said, well, can't we just ask questions? And so we came up with SARC-F, which is strength, uh, how, how much difficulty do you have in walking, uh, uh, in lifting something, uh, assistance in walking, rise from a chair, climb stairs, and how many falls have you had? And and um, this was done when I was at the NIH listening to a meeting that again was very boring. You know, by the 15th talk on sarcopenia, everybody says the same thing. So I was sitting there, I wrote this down, I sent it to Ted Malmstrom, who's a PhD who works with me, and said, we've got data, I've got a talk tomorrow, can you show me that I, when I talk tomorrow I can use this instead of all the junk that people wanted to use? And it turned out that the next day we presented it with the data saying, yes, this works just as well as anything else and has as good a, a, a way of telling you your outcome. Of course, everybody looked there and said, this is nonsense and we don't care because we have to have expensive ways to measure stuff. So this was what we showed in the SARC Air, that it's really uh, basically a reasonable way to measure things in our African-American diabetics. And then uh, Tony, when he was doing the study in our diabetic outpatients, also went ahead and looked at sarcopenia in that patient population, showed about 20% had sarcopenia. Most of them also had, uh, had frailty, so there is a lot of overlap. So you most probably only need to do one or two of these. But again, sarcopenia, highly predictive of hospital utilization, new disability, more predictive than your ability to treat glucose, so fixing muscle is more important. Uh, there are, like frailty, a ton of international uh, uh, validations of the SARC-F scale, but this is one done by J the Japanese saying it works in diabetics as well. So why does diabetes cause sarcopenia? For many, many reasons. Hyperglycemia causes advanced glycation end product. Diabetics have cytokine excess, which pulls, uh, uh, it destroys muscle. Diabetics tend to have lower testosterone. That destroys the muscle. Neuropathy, basically, when you have neuropathy, the muscles don't contract when you're at rest, so therefore your muscles become sarcopenic. Diabetics tend to have increased fat accumulation, particularly if they're obese. Insulin resistance leads to an increase in myostatin, which inhibits the muscle working. Uh, basically, with your insulin resistance, you have decreased protein synthesis and increased degradation. Uh, you get mitochondrial problems with insulin resistance, leading to increased oxidative da damage. Importantly, people with diabetes have poor capillary flow to the, the muscle. This is most probably the number one reason for insulin resistance. It's not that the insulin receptors don't work, but if you can't get any blood flow to the muscle and you don't have any muscle, there are no insulin receptors. It's sort of, you know, go figure. Anybody can work this out except I spent my whole time when I was training as an endocrinologist and subsequently trying to understand all this wonderful biochemistry that causes insulin resistance without realizing, and nobody ever said to me, you know, the problem really is they don't have enough muscle. The insulin resistance is a minor problem in comparison. But, you know, why didn't we think of that 25 years ago and stop w developing new drugs for diabetes and start actually exercising people and paying for the exercise coach? Makes a big difference talk about peripheral vascular disease, and I think that covers about 80% of the reasons diabetes does this. The look ahead study showed that basically if you exercise, you fundamentally will do better than if you don't exercise. So the conclusions for the first half of the talk are <coughs> diabetics are more likely to be frail than non-diabetics. This occurs at a younger age. Frailty and diabetes is associated with accelerated functional decline and more likely to go to hospital. Diabetics who lose muscle and muscle strength have a high likelihood to have sarcopenia. Both of these two are treated by, uh, by exercise and sarc F and frail can be used in the clinic and should be used in the clinic on every diabetic over the age of 50. At least we showed that in our clinic if nowhere else. Okay, so falls. Falls are obviously an important problem that people have, and diabetics, like they have more sarcopenia and more frailty, are more likely to fall than non-diabetics. Uh, older diabetics, about 20 to 31 percent 
uh, four per year. It's associated with uh, problems with perineal uh, response sensitivity, more renal failure, poor contrast sensitivity, you can't see well, and a low hemoglobin A1C in insulin users. If your hemoglobin A1C is below seven, and, or you're frail or have peripheral neuropathy, you're more likely to fall, and uh, they have worse vibration sense. So these are, like I showed you for muscle, all the different causes of falls in diabetics. And if you're an endocrinologist or a general internist and you see a diabetic, you need to go through all of these things because I'm going to show you that diabetics fracture their hip more often. And something that's bad for you is a hip fracture. Something that's not so bad for you is called diabetes. I mean, what I'm trying to say is it's the things down the line that if you don't fix, you're not going to do well with your diabetic treatment. So foot abnormalities, ankle dorsiflexion, decreased steps a day, reduced gait speed, peripheral neuropathy, sarcopenia, nocturia, incontinence, cardiac autonomic neuropathy, arrhythmias, myocardial infarction, orthostatic hypertension, postprandial hypertension, medication, decreased vision, stroke TIA, uh, don't think well, impaired uh, dual tasking, hypoglycemia, vestibular dysfunction, postural stay, carotid sinus hypersensitivity, hyponitremia, hyperglycemia, and vitamin B12 deficiency. All of these occur in diabetics, and if you don't pay attention to them, you run into trouble. Uh, basically, this just shows you what I said I was going to show you. Diabetics are more likely to fracture their hip than non-diabetics. So this is despite the fact that diabetics have more bone mineral density. They have a lot of calcium. This tells you that when you send somebody to have a bone mineral density measured, you're actually most probably wasting your time, and in 10, 20 years' time, we'll start to look at bone strength, particularly in people like diabetics. All we'll do, what we know we can do, is take the facts, questions, and forget about the bone mineral density. Should point out that there's now an ultrasound bone mineral density. It takes 30 seconds to do in the office practice, and certainly that should be being done in the endocrine service and virtually everywhere else, because it makes money for the primary care physician, and you can do it really quickly, 30 seconds, and be able to bull virtually the same as you can bull for a lunar. FDA just approved it. Okay, so fractures and diabetes, a big piece of this is increased bone porosity. This is because they have increased sclerostin, uh, which alters beta catenin, decreases bone turnover. They often have a low B, uh, vitamin D, increased PTH, increased osteolysis. And then we've talked all about the sarcopenia and the falls on the other side, all leading to fractures. The other thing that causes fractures are thiazolidine diodes. Thiazolidine diodes take calcium off the bone. Rosiglitazone, very well shown to do this and increase fractures. And this is a paper that said thiazolidine diodes don't do it. They gave the thiazolidine diode for a year. And in an ideal world, if I could draw a slide properly, this would be turned the other way around. And what this is actually telling you is that people on pioglitazone in a year lose about minus 0.7% of their bone mineral density. In one year, that's not statistically significant. Take that over 10, 20 years, and you've got no bone left. So you should not actually use these drugs, not because they cause edema, and perhaps, perhaps, perhaps heart failure, which was most probably all wrong anyhow, but because they cause bones to have problems. And they most probably do this by altering sclerostin and increasing the amount of sclerostin. What about syncope? So, Diabetics all have orthostatic hypertension, and I, oh, not all, but about 30% of them. I hope every one of you knows this is the old-fashioned way to measure blood pressure. If you're going to measure blood pressure in your office practice, you're going to get them to stand up. And yes, I know you don't put the arm down like this, but I was in a hurry when I pulled the slide. And it's only when I show the slide every time I think, now, nah, that's not the way to do a blood pressure. But I see it done all the time in the, our office practice, so who cares? Uh, so you have to measure blood pressure standing, particularly important in old people and particularly important in diabetes. If you're not looking for orthostasis, 
these people are going to fall, and these people don't have dizziness. They have dizziness very late, so you need to be aware of it. We can manage orthostatic hypertension. We can use abdominal binders, Job stockings for the students again. Remind you, if you're going to put a stocking on to, for orthostasis, it's got to be put on while you're lying in bed. You try and put these stockings on sitting at the side of the bed, it's hot. Lying in bed means somebody's got to help you put them on or they're not going to go on. One coffee in the morning will actually decrease orthostasis. If you have two cups of coffee, it won't work or during the day because it down-regulates the adenosine receptor. You can have two glasses of cold water four times a day. You can increase your salt, which most probably works better than anything else. You can work on exercise, increasing muscle contraction, avoiding heat, and there are a ton of drugs available. Mitodrin, by the way, was never really shown to work. This was one original study. The FDA approved it on compassionate grounds for diabetics, and it, the company promised to do a big study. They're still promising now, it's 25 years later, so so much for that one. It may or may not work. There's no great data to say it does. Fluidocortisone works, but the problem is it causes hypertension when you lie down. Uh, Pyridostigmine can work, but it's not usually used. The new drug is Droxydropa, not approved in diabetics, but improved in people with Parkinson's, and it actually seems to work better than any of the other drugs that are available. The other thing that happens in old people and in diabetics is postprandial hypertension. So this means that they basically drop their blood pressure after a meal. It's variable. It occurs about a third to a half of the time that people do it. It's more common in the morning. So if you have an afternoon clinic, you're going to miss it. Its prevalence is about 26%. It produces fall, syncope, stroke, myocardial infarction, and death. It's stimulated by carbohydrate and to a lesser extent protein. It's due, as we showed many years ago, to the release of a vasodilatory peptide, calcitonin gene-related peptide, that causes peripheral vasodilatation. It's not because all the blood rushes to the stomach, because no matter how much rushes to the stomach, it's not going to cause postprandial hypertension. You can't get enough. It's a peripheral vasodilatation. And I'm showing you this because the boards ask all the time, how do you diagnose it? And you're supposed to do an ambulatory blood pressure, which is most probably what almost everybody should have if you're thinking of treating them for hypertension or anything else. And once you do it, you pick up the changes with the ambulatory blood pressure and you can make the diagnosis that way. Why do I care about it? It's a totally treatable condition. So my favorite patient, now aged 84, when I first saw him was 70, and he came in having postprandial hypertension and diabetic. And basically I said, well, this is what you've got. And he said, well, what can you do? I said, oh, it's easy. I'll put you on miglitol, an alpha-1 glucosidase inhibitor, either carbos or miglitol. And the data is very good now. These block it. He's had two fainting episodes after meals. He forgot to take his miglitol. Otherwise, that's it after 15 years. And when we went back and tested him, he's still got postprandial hypertension if he doesn't take his drugs. Autonomic neuropathy, extraordinarily common in diabetics. This is a study I did when I was a resident, and it just points out that 72% of diabetics had some evidence of autonomic neuropathy, and about half had postural hypertension, and so on and so forth. Important in diabetics, autonomic neuropathy, because it creates the dead in bed syndrome. These are the people who have arrhythmias at night, and this doesn't matter. The first report was in 16-year-olds, but it occurs throughout the lifespan. So you have to be aware of this. And this is due to the cardiovascular autonomic neuropathy that goes along with the changes in orthostasis and everything else. And these people have many more cardiovascular events, particularly arrhythmias. And if you have somebody with autonomic neuro uh, cardiac and autonomic neuropathy, which means a, a bad bell salva, and they basically have orthostasis, uh, or either one of those two, you have to put in an implantable loop recorder because you don't pick these things up. People don't have their arrhythmia every day. It's sort of like we bring people who fainted into hospital, we put a halter monitor on. This is like stupid. We ask them, how often have you fainted? Well, the last time I fainted was two months ago. So now we give them 24 hours of a halter monitor and we send them home. Why? We say, it's not an arrhythmia. Of course it's not an arrhythmia in the next 24 hours. Most of them are picked up up to three or four years later and for diabetics, having treatable arrhythmia saves their life. 
So syncope and diabetics, not going to spend any real time on it to say just that basically you do the workup if they come in in the ED, only if they have evidence of heart failure, of heart disease, do you do an echocardiogram. Otherwise, it does not, it's not part of any of the recommendations for syncope. And so don't worry about the heart. Make sure you're not missing epilepsy, TIAs, or anxiety. They need ambulatory blood pressure monitoring at home, either first an event recorder and then a loop recorder. Uh, you most probably should consider carotid sinus massage in the ED, but if nobody does that, so let's forget it. And if they've got autonomic neuropathy, then you go ahead and work them up and see whether or not they've got a treatable arrhythmia. Okay, so now let's go to some simple things. When you've got diabetes, you can't see well. Most of the reason is shown here by Monet, who didn't have diabetes. I'll show you somebody else who had the same condition in a minute. But Monet had cataracts. And you can see the bridge across Gaverni has totally disappeared there. When he had his cataracts taken out, he complained. He said, the world doesn't look as beautiful as it used to. Diabetics up to 70 have much more cataracts than non-diabetics. So it's the first thing you've got to look at, because if you can't see, you're going to fall. If you fall, you're going to have a hip fracture. You're going to injure yourself. If you can't see, you can't inject your insulin properly. You know, we can go through all of this. There are many, many reasons why you should be able to look at this. And Retinopathy causes blue-green color blindness, as you see in the Cezanne painting there with his retinopathy. But also, as you get your macular edema, you start to get these holes in the, in the retina, in your vision, and 5% of persons over 70 have macular edema. Hearing loss. I know we all check hearing loss every time a diabetic comes in, which means that if they sort of, we think they answer our question, we say that's nice. Okay, so hearing loss is 10% more common in persons with diabetes. They have microangiopathy of the sphere vascularis. Uh, don't worry about the reasons. They have a neuropathic damage to the auditory brain stem. Hearing loss leads to cognitive decline, functional decline, decreased quality of life, and you should screen all diabetics for hearing loss. So now, as we come to the end, cognitive dysfunction. There are tons of papers that say diabetics get tons of Alzheimer's disease. They're all epidemiology. None of them ever check B12, which is metformin, which most diabetics are on. B12 deficiency causes cognitive dysfunction, but it doesn't worry the literature. And so every month or so, there's a new paper that says diabetes get, diabetics get Alzheimer's disease. So if you go and look, which is you do the post-mortem, it turns out that you get what you might expect. Very little Alzheimer's disease in diabetics, tons of vascular disease. What a surprise. So they have no amyloid plaques, few neurotic tangles, but they have lots and lots of little microinfarcts in their brain. If you've got a microinfarct in your brain, you can't think. So it's not surprising that that's what happened. Uh, when Tony was looking in our uh, endocrine clinic, and again, 20% of people 50 to 60, so these are not really old, had some degree of mild cognitive impairment done by the rapid cognitive screen. And fundamentally, he showed that the people getting metformin actually had much less than other people. So we looked at our animal studies, and we've shown that metformin improves memory both in diabetics and in Alzheimer's-like animals. And then uh, with Jeff Shear, we've actually looked in the VA database in 6,000, uh, a large number of people, 61,000 people. We got 11-year follow-up. And it turns out that if you have take metformin, your chances of getting dementia are much lower. So metformin appears to prevent dementia. We got less than five, a little below 5% for our grant that we sent in. So most probably going to get funded, and then we'll publish the paper. You've got to get funded before you can publish the data. You know, have the data to get write the grant, then you wait, and then when they give you the money, you publish the paper. It's crazy. OK, uh, depression, much more common was a paper we did in 1998, and we showed that diabetics who are depressed are more likely to die, more likely to finish up in hospital, and 
what I've time to tell you is diabetes interacts with aging to produce multiple geriatric syndromes together with comorbidities. Polypharmacy becomes a major problem in diabetics. And please, the FDA has now recognized metformin can be given down to a GFR of 30 moles per minute per um, uh, 1.73 meters squared. This means almost everybody can get metformin. This means we can give people metformin in a hospital. Uh, it's stupid to bring somebody into a hospital and not give them metformin. It's really stupid, okay. Uh, you're trying and putting them on drugs that are more likely to do harm. And all the data shows that metformin either by itself or in combination decreases mortality. So metformin is the drug of choice at older people. This is, I said at the beginning, people, are, it's okay to be fat if you're a diabetic. This is a study done by Barrett Connor and her colleagues that shows if diabetics lose weight, they fundamentally, and these were intentional weight losers, that they basically over five years are more likely to die. So you have to avoid weight loss. And this study just shows that if you're a diabetic, no matter what your age, if you exercise, you are less likely to die. And there is one study on sarcopenia with DPP-4 inhibitors that suggested, and I'm telling you it's suggested, I'm not saying it's proven, that DPP-4 inhibitors may decrease sarcopenia, making them a, a potential other drug in diabetics. So DPP-4 inhibitors have been shown to decrease hip fractures and most probably are the second choice. The American Diabetes Association says this in the, this year's uh, Diabetes in the Elderly, that if metformin isn't working, you go to DP4s. Why don't you use the others? Thiazolidine diones, I've shown you, cause osteoporosis. The beautiful new SGLT2 inhibitors are wonderful, except in old people, they cause dehydration and infection. They've got to be really good to say, I'm going to have somebody who's dehydrated, having recurrent infection, and I still want to give them the drug. It's way down the list. Sulfonylureas increase the chances of hypoglycemia, and when insulin is used, please, look for the cheapest drug, which I know will upset some of my endocrinologists, others will jump for joy here, but basically Lantus is an expensive drug. There's almost no data to say it's any better than the cheap NPHs. I'm sorry, but that's most probably where it is. I think Dr. Albert would most probably agree with that, but uh, most probably nobody else in the audience, but that's okay. I, I really think that cost is important. You know, we live in a world where we spend, every time a new drug comes out, we start giving it to people, and we don't say, is it working about as well? So to conclude, and this is the last slide, because Dr. Walden needs to do something, and that is basically that diabetes in older person, please screen for the geriatric syndrome. This is frailty, sarcopenia, anorexia with weight loss and cognition. This can be done with a rapid cognitive screen. It takes three and a half minutes to do when you get used to doing it. And all diabetics, but I would argue all patients with COPD, all patients with heart failure, or older people should have it done on a regular basis. Uh, so most probably everybody should have it done. But this is on diabetes. And this is most probably true for 50-year-old and above diabetics as, oppo uh, as opposed to some of the older people who need it. So thank you all very much. I can take maybe one question at which time Dr. Walden needs to do a presentation. Uh, so if you have one question, you're entitled to it. Otherwise, that's it. Any questions? Question for Dr. Morley. While, he's, while, you, while you're plucking up the courage, I ask him to, 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 to distinguish between always being right and thinking that you're always right. Oh, that's easy.